want to cook to my boyfriend more, but he eats meat and I don't. And the hardest part is that he doesn't eat nothing healthy, like everything that is a whole, whole wheat, whole rice, whatever that comes with healthy, kind of, then he doesn't like it and he doesn't eat it. And so I cook whatever, like I try best to cook, but he's getting skinnier, so... I'm, I'm just in a dilemma. Should I just like uh, cook him meat? It's, I, I really have a hard time to do it. Mm, you can't solve it that way. Send your boyfriend here. <laughs> he should do some really serious Zen practice with the Sangha. And then he will change. I try. And for that, he, you shouldn't be here. Because same time, very difficult when it's very advanced relationship and you don't have such problems at the everyday level, then you can do a lot of things. But if you're here, then he would believe that you are his authority. And he would have an authority problem. So send him here <laughs> because he has to attain what is eating meat inside. So you say, honey, you are eating meat and that's no problem then he will be already surprised because you probably already talked to him a lot about that and no. you didn't? So you, no, you are just getting his, started? Very good. I'm not eating so his brain. I'm just tell him, letting. tell him that, sweetheart, everything you do is okay, but you still you don't understand really yourself. So please understand yourself. And when you have done that, I give you more meat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take you to McDonald's, but not now. So, if he goes back from here wanting more meat, then I haven't done my job. <laughs> or the Sangha didn't motivate him enough. So, leave it to the group and that's just partly funny. Because when you have a relationship problem, usually the larger family can help out. The in-laws, the cousins, whoever. When you have a family problem, the larger group can help out. Like a Sangha or a study group or if it's a passion problem like AA, etc. And if that group doesn't work, then even a larger group, etc. So find his threshold. He's your boyfriend. You know his thresholds. I'm trying he to has cook various. My so find the threshold and just make him go beyond it. So if he comes to a bigger group, he has nobody to really argue with, but he can see things much better than in just a one on one couple relationship, all right? It takes time. Until he comes. I never said it's instant, like <laughs> calcium <laughs> in water. Psh, back, back. <laughs> it's not sparkling, okay? Mm -hmm. But it works. I'm, I'm, while eating, I'm sitting over there on the window and I always look on, this, on those three guys on the, up there. On they would be happy to hear you calling them guys, okay? Uh, <laughs> Or this year, Kobo and I, I, on the I, right, I would, he would just smack you right in the face. <laughs> he was just so tough. You know, he was Sung San Sunim's teacher, Kobong Sunim. Uh, and... Um, the first one? Well, from where? So if you look at the center, then center right. Uh -huh. The very thin face, okay? Kobong Sunim was very, very tough. The, the Japanese really gave him a hard time physically. And uh, he was Sung San Sunim's teacher. He did not accept any other monk, only him. And he taught nuns and lay people mostly. Monks are arrogant and lazy! <laughs> and he was mostly right. Mostly. But not completely. So he was an exception. The center is Mangong Sunim. Mangong Sunim is our great forefather. Without him, there would be no modern Korean Buddhism. So he gave 110 plus transmissions. And that's why the Dharma is so widespread today. And he must have perceived what's coming, okay? And uh, there are many famous stories with him besides the Kongans that you can read in our Kongan book. One was when the Japanese occupied Korea and they held a huge meeting with all the dignitaries present. And uh, it was tough because all the government, the military, the religious leaders, some really strong power holders, they were present. And they started to slowly turn Korean Buddhism into Japanese Buddhism. 
and they established their own married order, the Jingakjeon. And the only unmarried order was Chogyajong, or the predecessor of the Chogya order called the Nine Mountains School. So until the 1960s, when the Chogya order was officially registered and formed, there were many, many schools of Korean Son, and many people followed the lineage of the Sixth Patriarch. And everybody knew what a treasure that was. So the Japanese military leader, who was the head of the occupation force, he asked Man Gong Sinim, and this was a very, very kind of sinister question, when you're really, in all respects, down on your knees, somebody asks you, how can we help you? So that leader asked Man Gong Sunim, how can we help Korean Buddhism? Can you imagine? Your country has just been invaded, everything erased, no more resistance, and somebody asks from the occupation force this question? So Magong Sim said, if you want to help Korean Buddhism, don't touch it. And mind you, this was enough at that time for execution. Without that much of a trial, he was not executed. But he was respected more than before by Koreans and maybe covertly by some Japanese too. So we owe him a lot. And if you read his Kongans, I mean, his mind is just amazing. Look at the questions he's asking or the stories he's going through. So he's really in between Tang Dynasty and us. It's not as remote as Zen Master Un Mun, okay? Not as archaic as the Sixth Patriarch. You can feel he's close to us. He's like a hundred years, you know, earlier than us. But he is deeply rooted in that Son Bulgyo or Zen tradition. He's bringing forth the same message and the same mind as the old forefathers. And his teacher, center left, with the beard, is Kyung Ho Sunim. He was active about 140 years ago. And he brought meditation back to the foreground after hundreds of years of Confucianist suppression. Confucianist rulers, they suppressed the meditation part and they encouraged the sutra and the ceremony part. He said to Zen monks that you're not allowed to beg in the cities or let alone teach or live in the cities. You must go up to the mountains. You preach leaving home, leaving society, so you leave society and don't come back. So they took the Zen monks up on their word, the teaching of the Buddha, but they also cut their connection from society in a way that they could get any kind of support. And that lasted hundreds of years in the Yi or Chosen dynasty. Kyung Ho Sunim turned the trend around at the end of the 19th century and he showed what is meditation worth. So he was really changing patterns and uh, if you read his story, how he got enlightenment, that's a really tough one, you know. I don't quote it here, go after it, but when you sit a hundred days with a sword underneath your chin, just in case you fall asleep, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, my interest in the um, scripts here. Uh, that was scripted first in 2006, What's Facing Us, by Sol Chong Sunim, the Pangjang Sunim of Sudoksa. He was here for an initiation ceremony called Beam Raising Ceremony. And that was the spiritual beginning of this building, 2006. And the other one is eight years later, which you can see. 2014, the spiritual beginning of the Great Buddha Hall. Yeah, oh. which is on this little hill, oh, yeah. not far. Right. And literally it says, I bear witness that a Zen temple is being constructed here. And a nice poem and a few Chinese characters about uh, geomantic locations and that's it. Are those calligraphies at the end? Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is a calligraphy. Ah, yeah? Okay. Yeah. I thought just... Uh... 100%. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing in it that would not be a calligraphy. Okay. Good. More questions? In question, according to Taoism, mm, do you think it's okay to do Taoism practice and also Zen practice? Uh, well, there are two kinds of Taoism currently. One is the ritual Taoism, which is very different from the ascetic or meditative Taoism. The second one is very hard to find. The first is everywhere. 
in Taiwan and some places in uh, mainland China lately. So Taoism has uh, these two main branches. That kind of meditation practice which you might be referring to or the energy practice with Qigong and other things plus the healing plus many things, it's very very I wouldn't say complex, but it was never organized into a system like Buddhism was. So, of course, you can practice Taoism and Zen together, great, but you would be very hard pressed to find uh, Taoist schools that would give you the same coherence, the same structure, the same kind of doable practice or method that Zen has. Yeah, okay. In my case, I, for example, I, I have a book uh, about Taoism and trying out some stuff because it seems to be good for, for practicing, for helping me meditation. And do you think it's, it's okay to do that? Or <laughs> Why would I say yes or no? I haven't seen your book yet. I can only see you. You do what you want. Have a teacher, have some teaching, have a student group and you're young. Go, do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Next. Um, my question is about original energy. Because, well, was what I was taught that when we are in pure silence, what we meet is that our true uh, self full of compassion and love. And so I uh, connected to... Who taught to you that? That's what you think. Maybe I didn't put it right. In the, in the no, you just put more emotions on top of it than usual. Because this oneness that you refer to, when your original energy, Wangi, this great energy, Daigi, combine through your Kongi, your breath, becomes Hapki, your unified energy. And out of this oneness experience, it is possible to use it as a source of compassion and wisdom. But some people don't. Yes. We have to see that it's up to your precepts how you use your energy. It's not a consequence of a purity experience or oneness experience or awakening experience that you automatically become a good person. It's up to your vows, up to your bodhisattva determination that you want to help other people, other beings, this whole world, this whole universe. That's why and that's how it becomes loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, selfless help, etc. Many bad people that we say bad because they cause a lot of suffering and they're very selfish and they control a lot of other people's lives against their will. They're very clear. They are mentally very sharp. They even feel your emotions, but they manipulate your emotions. They see cause and effect very well, but they use cause and effect for their own benefit only. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is rooted in previous karma when their minds could become very clear. And if they didn't practice something, we don't know what, then they couldn't have become clear. Because the sensory reality really covers you up. That's what we call average human being mind. Not good, not bad, but little limited. Now some of these bad people who are really super selfish, they have a lot of mental powers. And they are very clear. But they only use it for their own benefit, for their own good, to control the world, to control other people, etc., etc. And please do not put any theory behind this. There is no kind of magic order or illuminate this kind of BS. No, no, no. We're talking really visible figures. Use your own eyes and ears. You find them. Out of this oneness experience comes only oneness. That's it. The rest is up to your vows, your direction. That's why Sung Jansen taught only direction, direction, direction. Wake up, save all beings. Wake up, save all beings. That's all. If you miss any of these two, you have a problem. Awakening can become this selfish game, or saving other people will lack the resources to really do it accurately, and efficiently, and truly, because awakening is not there. So thank you all for coming here for doing this practice from faraway countries. I wish all of you return home with the true experience of the Dharma and use this to help all beings, including yourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>